right, everyone. Welcome to an official event of the ninth annual MSG Science Festival. My name is Hazel Anderson, and I'm a member of the Science Festival team. Today with me, I have Dr. Sabrina Collins, who's going to tell us about the documentary Mentold. So take it away, Sabrina. All right. Thank you so much, Hazel, and to the entire MSU Science Festival team. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and uh, this is our, I believe, our third year uh, being a part of uh, the MSU Science Festival. And so I just have a few brief slides that I want to share. Um, and, and then we'll go into the, uh, the LTU Lawrence Tech uh, documentary, Women Untold. So I want to tell you a little bit about the work that we do at the Marburger STEM Center on the campus of Lawrence Tech. And so uh, basically the Marburger STEM Center, where I serve as executive director, you can think of it as the clearinghouse or the umbrella, uh, if you will, of all of these STEM activities taking place on our campus. Um, and that includes our high school summer camps, that includes uh, Extreme Science Saturdays, uh, that includes a number of partnerships with various organizations and school districts around the state. And so the Marburger STEM Center essentially has three different uh, focus areas. And that fir first priority really is supporting current LTU faculty and staff uh, and students. Uh, the second is that public engagement or that community engagement uh, piece. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And then industry connections. And so prior to the pandemic, we were delivering in-person uh, workshops. But like all of you, we've had to pivot right to a virtual uh, environment. And so an example of that uh, is a recent uh, workshop where, which was led by our STEM outreach coordinator, uh, basically a workshop focused on baking a cake and cupcakes with uh, middle school students. So these students were at home baking cakes in the kitchen. I'm not sure if their mothers, uh, their parents liked them doing that, but the kids had a lot of fun. And with all of these kinds of activities, you want to have a teachable moment. And so we talked to the students about the importance of monitoring your sugar intake and diabetes uh, as well. One approach we also take with engaging uh, the next generation of STEM leaders is to use movies and pop culture uh, to do that. And about three years ago, we published uh, an article, Black Panther Vibranium and the Periodic Table, uh, which really is a way to just engage them about chemistry concepts and STEM concepts. So if anybody is interested uh, in learning more about that, we can certainly talk about that during uh, the Q&A after the screening of the film. Um, and so I'm just delighted to be here to, uh, to uh, share uh, this documentary, Women Untold, which was directed, written, and produced by an LTU graduate, uh, Marie Ann Torres Lopez. Uh, was a, she's, a, she's a media communications major. And basically she assembled a fantastic team of Lawrence Tech students to make this documentary. It's a 30 minute film. Um, and uh, basically we're using it as uh, essentially an educational tool to address equity in a class in the classroom. And it tells a story of three different uh, women of color in STEM, Alice Augusta Ball, uh, Dr. Jill Plummer Cobb and Dr. Evelyn Boyd Granville. And so if you are interested, I am active on Twitter. That is my email address. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to begin showing the documentary, Women Untold. And I'm also going to uh, put the link to the video in the chat, just in case there are any technical issues. Okay, I just shared it in the chat, but now I'm going to share my screen. As a young girl, I was not taught about what other women. STEM had done, even of color. And 
uh, it wasn't until I actually got into the industry where I learned that there were women of color who were drinking for um, this country. They never really talked about it when I was a kid growing up. Most of the scientists that we explored when I was growing up were male, and they were not women, definitely not women of color. The truth is, women of color have been behind groundbreaking American achievements for decades. Many of their ideas were used to, to launch astronauts into outer space, to be launched into outer space, find life-saving cures, lead institutions, and so much more. While awareness of their longtime brilliance has improved, aided by the 2016 release of Hidden Figures, the conversation still has a long way to go. Hey, Sabrina, if you mute yourself, we can't hear it. This three-part series highlights the remarkable triumphs of just some women scientists of color. Dr. Jewel Plummer Cobb, Alice Augusta Ball, and Evelyn Boyd Granville. Three women who made remarkable strides for humanity and broke boundaries in the process. Approximately 700 students registered for the fall opening. And so therefore, none of us stands above the other person in God's sight. Our first figure rose to the top of academia and never took no for an answer. Women Untold, Part 1, Jewel Plumber Cobb. Train your sights on the laboratories of American industry to see what's ahead. It's a bewildering future, all right. One thing is certain. It is these research activities sponsored by American industry that have brought us this far and will continue to create further progress for us. Yes, chemistry has changed the world we live in. Jewel Plummer Cobb was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1924. The only child of a physician father and a school teacher mother and the granddaughter of a freed slave turned pharmacist. From early on, she was surrounded by academia. She was in early high school. She um, looked through a microscope first time in science class and that changed her life because that opened this literally opened this this whole world to her that she didn't know existed and once she had uh, had that experience that really kindled her interest in pursuing some type of career having to do with science growing up Cobb was no stranger to racial injustice the segregated school system in the 1920s and 30s forced her and other African-American children to attend overcrowded and underfunded schools. It's been a challenge accessing equal or higher education just for the fact of being African-American. People that have succeeded have really worked very feverishly hard in order to obtain their goal. And that's exactly what the young girl did. She worked diligently to remain an excellent student, and once at Inglewood High School, Cobb was placed in the Honors Track program. In 1941, she began studying biology at the University of Michigan, at a time when there were only 200 black students at the entire school. However, being a pioneer did not come without its challenges. Big Ten universities were still a disaster for black students then, and U of M was no exception. I was uh, forced to live in a dormitory that was segregated. All black students lived there. It became very difficult for me at that time. I didn't like the idea of being and living in a certain 
part of the Ann Arbor where only black students could live. The problem becomes when your ethnicity requires that you have a lesser access to resources, which was mostly the case for people of African descent, with intent to hold a person or a community back. That became, became the problem. As a result, one year later, Cobb transferred to Alabama's Talladega College to complete her degree. It was there that she found a more welcoming environment, one that was better suited for her success. Unfortunately, upon graduation, her challenges were not exactly over. When she applied for grad school at NYU, she was initially not granted an interview. The school accepted her as a student, but denied her a teaching position because of her race. Fortunately, she was one of those people that very early on understood that no means maybe, and maybe means yes. So she um, persisted in her um, attempts to get an interview and was accepted. And actually, she's the first woman of color in the United States to receive a PhD in biology. This was in 1951, I believe. But they're on their way to new ideas, new things that will astonish us when they are announced. They are working constantly to solve problems and find ways to give us what we want. Cobb's first job out of university was at the Harlem Hospital Cancer Research Foundation, a commendable position in itself. During her time with the foundation, Cobb made remarkable strides for cancer research. She studied the effects of new chemotherapy treatment options on skin cancer, wrote multiple groundbreaking papers, and saw her work circulated in various publications. Her extensive work here ultimately provided the foundation for the future treatment of skin and other types of cancer. It was around this time that she had her only child, with then-husband Roy Cobb, a son named Jonathan. She was, she was, a, she was a great mom. She was, she, was, she was very warm. She was very involved. She was fun to be around. So we did a lot of things together. Um, she, was, she was very active, very energetic. Please go to movies, and I would hang out with her in her lab at the end of the day sometimes and help out with taking care of the mice, uh, the mice which she used as part of her research. She became an administrator at various universities, including the University of Illinois and Connecticut College. Though, perhaps her most crowning achievement took place in 1981, when she was named president of California State University Fullerton the first African-American woman west of the Mississippi to lead a large institution. She was president for nine years until her retirement in 1990. The causes she really promoted, in other words, a major one was being research active and getting women um, acknowledged for what they could do as in academia. It's the kind of things you talk about in graduation and to when she met with smaller groups. She advocated for these causes she was interested in by showing her students she was interested in, by giving them research uh, opportunities, by explaining to them the various steps that one has to take in order to achieve a long distance goal. In 1979, she famously wrote, it is wasteful to neglect bright and young female minds which have considerable contributions to make in every scientific field. She really represents um, the classic example of going from a professor and then making her way up to provost and all the way to a college president. You don't really you rarely see that, uh, particularly with women of color leading a research uh, institution. Because even today, you still don't have a number of, you know, you don't have a, a lot of uh, women uh, leading these uh, research institutions. So it's still an incredible uh, career milestone. For just the magnitude of how trendsetting she was in so many ways, nearly everywhere that she went, she was the only, um, only person of color in the room, and more often than not, the only woman in the room. Her relentless career didn't go unnoticed. Her work led to numerous awards and recognitions. These include being the first black woman appointed to the National Science Board, a Lifetime Achievement Award in 1993, and over 20 honorary degrees. The progression of my ancestors is the American dream personified, going from um, being 
enslaved to being president of a major university. Cobb passed away in 2017 at the age of 92. Her impact, however, is still felt. Dr. Cobb working on skin cancers. How many people are being diagnosed today but get relief from their disease or their illness based on research that she did decades ago? I love hearing when people come up to me and say, seeing your mother's accomplishments made me know that I could accomplish my life. She was just a really wonderful human being and it was a real role model for women and not just women of color, all kinds of women. He showed what women can be in the way of leader, a leader. How I would like my mother to be remembered as um, somebody who cared, somebody who not only worked hard for herself, but worked hard for other people and was as concerned with bringing other people along with her than just in her own accomplishments. She always understood that um, we all stand on the, the, um, on the shoulders of giants. And you can't, you can't, you can't forget that. Um, so you have to acknowledge that and you have to be a giant for the people. and almost became lost forever in history, all before the age of 24. Women Untold, Part 2, Alice Augusta Ball. Alice Augusta Ball was born in Seattle, Washington in 1892. She was the third out of four children from James and Laura Ball. Her father worked as a lawyer, while her grandfather, James Ball Sr., had been an acclaimed photographer. Though her grandfather took many photographs in his career, there is ironically little pictographic evidence of the young Alice and her family. In 1902, her family moved to Honolulu, Hawaii, in hopes the warmer weather would improve James Ball Sr.'s diminishing health. Unfortunately, the grandfather passed away not long after the move, pushing the family to return to Seattle. Once back, Alice attended Seattle High School, earning top grades, most especially in the sciences. She went on to study at the University of Washington, where she earned two degrees, one in pharmaceutical chemistry and the other in pharmacy. During this time, her work as a student began to excel, far beyond any barrier society imposed. Stores refuse lunch counter service to Negro students. She actually published uh, her research like in 1914 in, a, in the Journal of, Amer of the American Chemical Society, which is a pretty prestigious journal to this day. You know, it's pretty rare that someone of color was doing research and actually publishing, you know, back then. And the interesting thing is that her PhD professor later in college in Hawaii had never been published in the American Journal of the Chemical Society, yet she had this PhD in chemistry. Ball's career, however, was just getting started. She returned to Hawaii to earn her master's degree from the College of Hawaii now known as the University of Hawaii in 1915. Once she completed her master's, she was hired as a chemistry professor at the institution, becoming both its first African-American and first woman professor. While teaching, she began to research a treatment for Hansen's disease, an infectious skin and nerve illness, more commonly known as leprosy. Leprosy is a condition that's caused by a bacteria, and it's a Type of bacteria that looks like rods underneath the microscope and actually has a type of name called an acid fast bacilli. These patients not only have the social stigma of having things on their face, but they also get deformed fingers and feet. 
and then further along in the disease could cause permanent paralysis of that limb if it is upper torso, hands, and then the feet uh, would be disfigurement, maybe the inability to walk. Um, extreme cases would be amputation for these, these poor patients. Up until she began her research, Shamugra oil had been used to treat the disease. It was an oil derived from the seeds of a tropical evergreen tree and was usually applied on the skin or ingested. While there was some relief from this method, results were inconsistent and sometimes even backfired on patients. The problem with sugar oil is that oil, as you know, and water do not mix. And the human body is made up of 65 to 70 percent water. So when you put oil into water, you know what it does, it just stays together. So they had to figure out a way to make it so it could be absorbed and become kind of therapeutic. In search of a better way, Ball isolated the ethyl esters from the Shamukra oil. The results? A safe, injectable form of the oil treatment. In other words, she hit a home run. This wall is crushed. To accomplish what thousands of scientists from the 17th century onwards have been trying to do. And she did it in such a quick period of time. We're talking months, not years. To me, that speaks of a genius. And just like that, Ball, a young African American woman, can point at the most effective treatment for leprosy during the early 20th century. Her discovery would ultimately help treat countless leprosy patients up until the 1940s when cell phone drugs were introduced. However, Ball's story quickly took a dramatic turn. In 1916, soon after her breakthrough, her findings still not published, she became ill. So much so that she stopped everything and returned home to Seattle. Only a couple months later, on December 31st, Ball passed away at the tender age of 24. The cause of her untimely death is not quite certain. While some sources report tuberculosis, Others suggest it was the result of a lab accident involving chlorine. Yes, her death was still in question because as we've seen her death so difficult and it is confusing. And it I didn't know you could change death certificates, but it has been changed. Things have been crossed out. Different handwriting appears to add extra things. After her passing, College of Hawaii President Arthur L. Dean continued her work and soon the Shamukra injections were in demand all over the world. However, amid all the success, Dean never gave her credit for the discovery. Ball's name remained hidden from the world. And unfortunately, this theft was not the first of its kind. It's been a trend since the days of enslavement. We say that Eli Whitney created the cotton gin. Eli Whitney was the owner of the person who created the cotton gin. Latimer worked with, with Thomas Edison. It has been a trend for centuries, being able to be honest that this black individual did this great thing, maybe a little bit of a, a thumb in the eye to somebody who's been saying all for 100 years or 200 years, they couldn't do anything. It wasn't until a 1922 paper published by Harry T. Holman, an assistant surgeon at Kalihi Hospital in Hawaii, cited Ball as the mind behind the Shamukra injection. Slowly but surely, she's received the recognition she was due. In 2000, almost 90 years after her discovery, the University of Hawaii honored Ball with a plaque mounted on the only Shamukra tree on campus. And in 2007, they awarded her with the Regents Medal of Distinction. Moreover, in 2016, she was named by Hawaii Magazine as one of the most influential women in Hawaiian history. She had lived, I mean, like the world was open to her. She could have done anything. Uh, probably even gone on to win a Nobel Prize. She died so young and was not able to really see the impact uh, of her work because thousands of people you know, benefited from her, uh, from her discovery. Before they found a treatment, people would die. And they would die with a lonely death. I think what Al has provided to the whole world, not only to these patients for the first time, from the point of view, at least from a 
not that sound. But she gave up to them. But I think she also inspired other doctors and researchers to double down and say, oh, this is not an incurable disease. It can be treated. So I think what she gave the world for a brief period of time was hope. who helped NASA make critical advances three different times. Women Untold, Part 3, Evelyn Boyd Randall. Born in Washington, D.C. in May of 1924, Randall was the youngest child of Julia, a homemaker, and William Boyd, a chauffeur. Growing up, Randall lived in a segregated society. Limitations were imposed on African Americans in all respects. She herself attended colored-only schools in Washington. However, at Dunbar High School, she encountered teachers dedicated to counteracting any messages that society threw at their students, inspiring them to work hard and go on to college. When they're especially getting messages that, you can't do this, this isn't for you, somebody out there, that, that one person that says, someone thinks you can't do it, do you think you can't do this? Well, I think you could do it. Um, that can, that can be so, not only eye-opening to the child who's never heard anything positive, that can, it can seem like something small. It can be that one person who just sort of almost offhandedly says, oh, you, you're interested in being a scientist? Yeah, sure, you could be a scientist, why not? That could be the thing that, that makes that child go, yeah, I could. With confidence, Granville enrolled at Smith College, a private institution for women in 1941. As an undergraduate, she majored in mathematics, though also studied theoretical physics and astronomy. She graduated from Smith College, summa cum laude, the highest distinction, in 1945. Randall decided to continue her studies and applied for graduate school at both the University of Michigan and Yale University. She was accepted to both, though chose Yale, which offered her a full scholarship. series in the complex domain. Granville became the second African-American woman in the U.S. to earn a Ph.D. in mathematics, second only to Dr. Euphema Lofton Haynes, who earned a Ph.D. in mathematics in 1943. Granville's professional career skyrocketed in January 1956, when she accepted a position at the International Business Machines Corporation, also known as IBM. IBM was huge. They were the computer company. And they were, before that, they were the um, electric typewriter company in, in the 1960s. They were very big. They had a computer or a typewriter called the Selectric. It probably compares to Apple because everybody knew IBM. Their name was on their um, printers. Their name was on their typewriters. Their name was on the like, computers. If you worked for IBM uh, writing computer programs, that was a very very um, prestigious job. Soon after she joined, IBM secured a contract with NASA. The company was tasked with ensuring the upcoming Project Vanguard's success in space. Electric Vanguard was our first artificial satellite program. We lost the space race to the Russians. In the fall of 57, they put up Sputnik and Sputnik 2, and were launched into the space race. And we take satellites for granted nowadays. We've got GPS that lets us call up a car and pick us up at our house. Um, but at that at that time, we had no artificial satellites up there. So Vanguard was the name of the program where we were trying to put them, launch them, and then put them into work. Granville, in New York at the time, writing computer programs for the IBM 650, immediately requested to join the project. The request was granted, and she transferred to NASA's real-time computing center in Washington, D.C. There, she was instrumental in developing orbital calculations for the satellite. In 
1960 with one NASA mission under her belt, she moved to Los Angeles with her then-husband, Reverend G. Mansfield Collins. In L.A., Granville joined the staff of the North American Aviation Company as a research specialist. The NAA was soon awarded a NASA contract for the design of the space vehicle in Project Mercury. Later on, they'd be in charge of the same for Project Apollo. Project Mercury was now part of our manned spacecraft, so we put satellites up, but again, we lost the space race to the Russians. Yuri Gagarin made one orbit around, so uh, Mercury was our first manned space flight. We had some suborbital, which would be it would launch off the Earth and get out of the atmosphere, but then come right back down again. Uh, the Russians put up another person into a single orbit, and then finally we got John Glenn to be able to go three times around in orbit. The Apollo missions were the famous ones. They're the man on the moon. So the project was launch three people, put them into orbit around the moon, separate from that uh, orbiting capsule, land on the moon, lift back off again, collect or connect back again, and then come back to the Earth. So we put a man on the moon and return the men from the moon. Granville's computational work for the NAA would go on to assure that American astronauts would land first and safely on the surface of the moon. Granville remained on Project Apollo until 1967. In 1989, she wrote, I can say without a doubt that this was the most interesting job of my lifetime. To be a member of a group responsible for writing computer programs to track the paths of vehicles in space. Now, what's interesting about uh, Dr. Evelyn Boyd Granville is that her story is related to the movie Hidden Figures. And because, you know, that movie, as you know, focused on women that were actually working as computers uh, at uh, NASA. So she was able to use her mathematic ability, you know, to help uh, get mankind into space. Over the course of her career, Granville held numerous positions in academia, government, and industry. She taught mathematics at this University in Nashville, California State University, as well as Texas College in Tyler, Texas. She also worked as a mathematician at the National Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C., focusing on calculations for the development of ballistic missiles. After her retirement in 1997, she spent a lot of her energy encouraging mathematics education at all levels. She traveled across states to speak to middle school children about the importance of math and even returned to Yale University to lecture on how to best teach mathematics. Today, Evelyn Boyd Granville is living in Washington, still always active in attending engagements according to reports. In a 1990 video, she summarizes what she thinks about race and racism amid all her groundbreaking success. I think the way to win people is to, to love people. We all want, first of all, we want a good life, we want a safe life, and we want the best for our children in our community. And that transcends any religion or nationality. So there you have it, three women who made remarkable strides for humanity and broke boundaries in the process. It's important to note that for every story brought forward, there are countless others that have yet to be told. A great change is at hand, and our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I really appreciate this. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's such an awesome, awesome documentary. documentary. 
It looks, it looks like, like uh, we have a question in the Q&A. Um, someone, someone asked, asked how, how did you select, select these, women these women for your, for your film? film? Oh, that's a, a great question. And so um, just to give you a little bit of the backstory. So I was uh, a, uh, a writing a column for an online magazine called Undark. Uh, focusing on, and that magazine, uh, it's published by MIT. Um, they focus on uh, the intersection of science and uh, society. And so they were accepting proposals for, for, uh, for columns. And so I pitched the idea of writing articles that celebrate the contributions of women and people of color in the STEM disciplines. And so I wrote a total of six uh, different articles and so I provided all six of those articles to Marie Ann, uh, we call her May, um, and I asked her um, if she would be interested in possibly writing a documentary. And I gave her the six articles to, uh, to look at. And so she basically decided on three of them uh, to use. And I think her reasoning was, which I, I think was really good, is um, you wanna be able to have enough information to tell a compelling story, you know? And so, I mean, she could have told different stories, right? With, uh, with the three that she highlighted, but that's basically how she ended up settling on, she went from six uh, articles to, to three and specifically focusing on three different women. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you ever, like, like is there thoughts about doing a like second version of this with other people? Absolutely. Um, and so one of the, that's a great question. So one of the things that I want to do is do more, you know, documentaries like this, uh, because there's so many stories right out there that 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 need to be told. And in fact, I'm teaching uh, a course right now, a social science seminar course uh, at Lawrence Tech with 11 students. And their final project is to film a documentary, a five minute documentary using their cell phone. And it has to be based on um, some aspect of, of STEM. So finding ways you know, to get these stories out there. So yeah, absolutely. There are so many other stories that I wanna tell. Um, and I love being around young people because they come up with the really creative ideas. And so like when Marie Ann took on this project, I just gave her the articles and she ran with it and assume, you know, assembled a team and things like that. So absolutely, we're interested in doing uh, more films. Awesome. I don't see any other questions. All right. Well, I thank you and I thank everyone who's who's watching and, you know, uh, please reach out to me at uh, scollins at ltu.edu if you're interested. And I'd love to uh, chat further, you know, about how the film can be used in a classroom. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. All right. Take care.